2012's Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, I was excited to see an update of a solid Western RPG that wasn't an immediate success, but gained something of a cult following in the years after its developer effectively imploded. However, few cult classics hold up well on a design level when viewed through a modern lens, and Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning doesn't buck that trend. It may be an updated version of what was once a forward-looking adventure, but fails to really deliver on the re so cheekily jammed into its title by bringing it up to par with its current competition. Here's what we said in 2012. This is a Western RPG with not only the meat necessary to keep you involved for scores and scores of hours, but it's also a Western RPG with something rare in the genre, amazing gameplay. Amalur isn't the perfect package, and it doesn't do anything exceptionally new in terms of quest types, story, or other conventions of the fantasy-themed RPG. But its gameplay is sublime. Put it all together, and you'll find a WRPG you won't have any problems dumping your time into en masse. Now, a lot of what our reviewers said then holds true in the 2020 remaster, but nearly every one of those items has a big asterisk next to it that all lead to the same footnote, for its time. A western RPG with satisfying action combat? Amazing! For its time. Being able to respec your abilities to try different playstyles whenever you like? Inspired! For its time. Fully voiced NPCs throughout the world that don't all sound like one or two people doing the exact same voice for all of them? Okay, I still really appreciate that one in 2020, but I can definitely tell when I run into Matt Mercer. The malicious store of potions has been used up. Better to invite a wolf into your home, I say. <laughs> so many parts of what originally made Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning special in its time now feel mundane, or at worst, heinously outdated. Amalur's combat is still its strongest aspect. It's a satisfying and arcadey take on RPG combat, more reminiscent of the older God of War games than its contemporaries like Skyrim or Dragon Age. Timing and skill are almost as important as the abilities you've got selected or what weapons and armor you've got equipped, and there's plenty to agonize over that regard thanks to copious loot drops and the ability to respec your character's skills at vendors around the world. That being said, while there was a mostly consistent challenge present right up until the final boss, it all felt pretty basic when compared to more modern games with similar combat systems like 2018's God of War or Sekiro or even something like Horizon Zero Dawn, and I found my interest in mastering its limited nuances waning well before I reached the finale. <laughs> Graphics are far and away Amalur's weakest link, though. Yes, the textures have been reworked for 4K screens, and it's got a boosted frame rate and improved anti-aliasing, but the remastering here feels like little more than one would see in an Xbox One X enhanced version. And even with the new hardware adjustments, the draw distance is surprisingly short. Similarly, while our original review specifically praised Amalur for its stability, especially relative to other open-world games of the same era, I experienced several crashes, corrupted save data, and frequent visual glitches throughout my playthrough on a PlayStation 4 Pro. From a UI standpoint, while its menus and interface might have been acceptable eight years ago, today they feel clunky and impractical. Inventory management's something you'll do a lot of thanks to a relatively limited carry capacity and the frequency at which you'll collect mountains of new gear, is constantly bogged down in closing one menu only to have to open another even to do something as simple as equip a primary and secondary weapon. Dialogue menus, which are basically just a list of nouns that you can pick from to get an NPC to spout lore about that topic, take up like half the screen for what could have easily been 15 to 20 percent max, and that small all HUD option does nothing to help this. It's not a modern redesign by any means. That said, there's a big world to explore with a familiar but unique take on classical fantasy. While most of the characters sport a fairly traditional fantasy look and the environments definitely show their age in terms of density, each area of the map boasts some genuinely interesting and unique location designs. There are plenty of captivating sites all across Amalur's map, and there's plenty to do in almost every one. Amalur's main story doesn't feature the branching paths of, say, Mass Effect 2 or The Witcher 3, but what it lacks in the flexibility of its stories, it makes up for in sheer volume of stuff to do. Even before you get into the two DLC expansions that are included in Re-Reckoning, there's an impressive amount of side quests, faction stories, and ancillary adventures. It took me more than 40 hours to reach the end credits, the main story chunk of which was mostly satisfying, despite a few tired cliches and a lot of 11th hour exposition, and I definitely wasn't stopping to smell the roses after the first 10 or 15 of those hours. If you visited every settlement, dealt with every faction, and accepted every challenge that came your way, you'd likely be looking at well over 100 hours before you cleared everything and moved on to the DLC. And if you enjoy diving into the lore of a game's world, there's plenty in Kingdoms of Amalur. There are literally thousands of years of history to read into, developed by the popular fantasy author R.A. Salvatore, and that's something that NPCs throughout the world are all too happy to give you a lesson on. 
But while the option to dive headfirst into such a detailed mythos is appreciated, it's something of a double-edged sword. Yes, there's a lot to learn about if you want, and it definitely enhances the world, but there are plenty of times where it felt like characters were simply vomiting exposition and oral histories at me, to a point where my eyes started to glaze over, eager to get back to stabbing things. The first was the Battle of Galifor Plain. Then... Oh, don't get me started. It's also worth noting that the development team did take steps to make Amalur replayable, especially towards its endgame, adjusting the math behind the scenes that determines the difficulty and rarity of loot available in a given zone. It might not sound like a huge adjustment, but I honestly can't imagine having to revisit locations to finish side quests only to grind through low-level enemies and finding chests full of worthless gear, so this was a significant improvement. On some levels, Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning is still a worthwhile RPG to hack and slash your way through, even if this remaster doesn't go above and beyond the bare minimum expectations. But while the ideas and mechanics that make games like Red Faction Guerrilla and Burnout feel special are still largely singularly unique to them, almost everything that made Amalur stand out in its day has become standard fare for just about any RPG to come out in recent memory. Its fast-paced action still entertains, for the most part, and there's plenty to see and do in its big world, but after almost a decade of innovation and improvements, it no longer feels particularly extraordinary, and the technical issues it does have are far less excusable. Re-Reckoning is a good reminder of what made the original so great for its time, but more importantly, it's a testament to how far we've come in the decades since.